what is the point of this whole body of law? Why do we have copyright? Why do we have rights of publicity and so forth? And it, it's all too easy, and I fear that it's <laughs> courts do it quite a lot too, to get to lose sight of the underlying goal and instead simply to proceed by applying a bunch of rules without any sense of that the rules were actually there for a reason. The goal of copyright is to encourage progress and also to encourage dissemination of work. If you were, so to speak, the copyright czar and you were grading the balance that we are currently striking, how would you grade it in terms of that goal? The goal of encouraging progress, that is to say, encouraging people to make new works. Now, obviously, making new works, there's a lot to encouraging it. On the one hand, as Chris pointed out, making new works is expensive. You need to get paid for it. To get paid for it, you may need a legal right one of the rights is a copyright, which you can trade away. That gives you a power to make a deal. The deal pays, and this is why we care about it, for the, the work that you're going to do. You can say, I'm going to be paid for this, so you can get someone to invest in it, uh, or you can run it up on your credit card uh, and believe that one day you're going to be paid for it. Um, you can make your movie because of that right that you're going to be traded away. That's one of the goals. But another thing that you'd have to do in setting this scheme up is also to assure access to raw material to make movies in the future. I mean, Chris's uh, clips in particular pointed this out. As Jennifer said in setting up the conference so eloquently, documentary films are records of our culture. But our culture is full of copyrighted culture. If you walk around the streets, actually just try doing this, walk around the streets and try not to encounter something copyrighted or trademarked. Cover your eyes or your ears. The moment that you hear someone playing a song, the moment that you walk by a storefront that has a fragment of a movie being played, the moment, although this turns out not to be the law, but rather what some um, very bad legal advice suggests the law, the moment that you see a trademark logo going by you, imagine as it were blurring out intellectual property from the world, what would be left? Not very much. You'd have a kind of Giacometti sculpture vision of the world with all of the reality stripped away. Copyright law should be designed to minimize the amount of legal knowledge needed, to make the law easy for lawyers to understand, but easier still for artists to understand. That's not necessarily the law we have. So in the striking this balance between access and incentives and control have what has what we've heard so far, does it indicate we're striking it in the right way? There's this, now, copyright law, as you'll hear through, over the course of the day, strikes that balance in lots of different ways. It does it in one way by saying certain things just aren't copyrightable at all. So facts aren't copyrightable. Ideas aren't copyrightable. But the trouble is, particularly when you're making movies, that you're capturing the stuff that is copyrightable, expression, and also things that are protected by other rights. Where it gets more fascinating and more complex is where you add in all of the other rights are involved and where you add in some of the complexities of how all of this law, which exists on the books and in court cases, then gets applied in the business of making movies where you may not be dealing with a judge or a legislator, but rather someone who deals with insurance or someone who's a distributor who needs to be calmed down. So imagine that I'm an eager um, uh, documentary filmmaker and I'm convinced that I'm going to be a, you know, a new uh, Hedgedus, Penny Baker, Saltzman, whatever, and I, I go out and I decide that I'm going to do a, you know, a second version of the War Room. I'm, I'm going to follow the, the Kerry and, and Bush campaigns. And, of course, in the course of this, um, political campaigns are constantly playing music, showing, taking other people's advertisements uh, and so forth and putting them on. And I go around... Uh, recording all of this, but I'm also recording the staffers uh, playing songs, I'm watching them watch TV, the same kinds of things, playing yeah. video games, and also making commentaries on the video games, comparing them to uh, current political figures, mainly Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, I've got shots of those kinds of people. And I think it's absolutely brilliant. I'm convinced of my own brilliance. And somehow, and of course this would not actually happen, I managed to make my way into John Sloss's uh, office and I slam the film down on the table and I say, here it is, it's great, and it's all protected by fair use. Now tell me, what needs to happen before this goes on a screen? What I say is, well, if we can get an insurance company to give us an E&O policy to cover this, then uh, let's, so what's, ma let's what's, make it their problem. What's an E&O policy? Because uh, I'm, I'm a total neophyte. See, I don't uh, know these it's things. It's errors and omissions insurance, and uh, it's meant to cover all the issues that would arise um, 
from someone coming after you for everything you've basically stated. No, included. it's all fair use. I don't need insurance. Let's just go ahead without insurance. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've uh, made my job more difficult than uh, <laughs> I w it would be incumbent upon me to uh, persuade uh, the exploiter, the distributor, or the broadcaster, or whomever we're trying oh, I to need license. A distributor? To. Um, <laughs> well, maybe not. You know, in the future, in the internet, if you know, if people have wide enough, uh, you know, tubes, then you can actually just put it up on your site, and that's an interesting conversation. But yeah, I mean, the, I mean, if you're coming to me saying uh, I don't need insurance, uh, then you've basically taken yourself out of the ball game mm. for the, the people who are the the conduits to a broader public. Um, I, my my immediate response would be to say get a website and put it up and and then you know find a way to get to people with broadband so they can come directly to you and see your work. Hmm. Uh, so, but I I know I, I like the idea of seeing it on you know HBO or the Discovery Channel. So I want to go to broad. So who who gives these E and O policies? These are nice people, I'm sure. Why don't we explain to them that it's fair use? Yeah, it's a, it, it's funny. It's a very uh, it's a very tricky, ever changing world and. Uh, it's, it's kind of an interesting shell game or poker game because what you have is a number of insurance companies. The main players are the insurance companies, the brokers, who can really go through to all the insurance companies and who are your friends and really the middlemen between us and the filmmakers on one side and the insurance companies on the other. And then the lawyers who are employed by the insurance companies. And this is a really small group of people. So... Now, let's say, is there any pressure? So I, one thing I was kind of hoping for was that there would be this competitive market where different insurance companies would push each other to be more risk prone uh, or other ones would be more risk averse and there would be this jockeying and that this would try and give me a spread. Some ones would be more avant-garde. What you told me doesn't reassure me and this is an interesting link between media concentration and um, the actual application of the fair use doctrine. Do I have any hope from the distributor side? Is If there isn't a push, well, it's interesting. is there a pull side? It's interesting. I guess I'll say two things about that. Um, the insurance business used to be much more competitive in this realm. An event occurred um, a couple years ago that actually uh, I think is seen as the root cause of, uh, of that reduction in this competitiveness. And I, I suspect that no one in this room could guess what it was. Um, but it was 9-11. Hmm. And uh, what happened, that, that event shook the insurance policy for obvious, or the insurance industry for obvious reasons. Uh, and I think its impact was seen in a lot of different places. And oddly enough, one was uh, in uh, the copyright world or in the, in the motion picture world. I think this was seen as a high risk, less profitable part of the business that insurance companies provided. And it's really taken a hit. Um, the other, uh, I guess the other point I wanted to make is, is that we had a really interesting um, case study in what, exactly what you're talking about at Sundance this year, and that's with the film uh, Super Size Me. Of any of the films at Sundance, it was, it was easily the most popular. But what, what, what happened is that there was a stampede of, um, of end users, of, of uh, broadcasters and conventional distributors to pick up the film. We had an errors and omissions policy, a standard errors and omissions policy going into Sundance. Uh, there was one little uh, wrinkle. Uh, it excluded claims uh, from the McDonald's Corporation. <laughs> uh, so, so it was our job uh, to both manage the, the wild excitement um, of all the potential buyers in the context of this sort of hothouse environment of Sundance uh, and as the you know, as the sales agent and as the lawyer, explain to them how they shouldn't worry at all that uh, that the errors and omissions policy excluded McDonald's. Uh, and it really led to a lot of very interesting conversations, and it led to a very interesting process.